Got a new report here. Apple foldable phone. It's been, we've been hearing about it. And some have disputed it. In fact, many in the Apple camp previously talking about folded devices, folding devices, not all that excited when they saw the Samsung stuff. They said, ah, it's a gimmick, things like this. Mm. But then we saw all these patents rolling out and variety of rumors. No, no, no. Apple's going to do a folding device. They're just waiting to figure it out. But the questions remain because you sit there, you look at a company that Actually, as far as tablets are concerned, they sell most of the tablets that are out there, mm -hmm. at least that people talk about. Android tablets never really took off in the same fashion with the same branding, the same brand as the iPad did. And Apple wants to sell you one of those and they want to sell you the phone. So it's like, would this kind of break that combo of products and turn it into one, particularly if they went at it from the folding tablet standpoint? Mm -hmm. as opposed to the folding phone standpoint, which comes back to the conversation I've had a number of times here on this show about whether or not the Z Fold from Samsung is a folding tablet or phone. Because once you've got it unfolded, it's actually the size of a small tablet, mm. which also happens to be a phone, as opposed to a phone, which also happens to be a tablet. Do you understand? Do you see what I'm saying here? I'm trying. Yeah, I know. It's very difficult. It's a terrible explanation. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is the clamshell model foldables, like the Motorola product and Samsung's other product, the Flip, those to me are more folding phones because they unfold to their active position to become the form factor of what we would consider to be a phone right now. I consider the other ones that unfold into tablet territory or close to it to kind of be folding tablets that happen to have a phone in them. Hmm. I think I just said the same thing twice. And no one, Still no one really gets what I'm saying. But either way, if Apple chooses to do a 7-inch product, which is what this particular article is stating, 7-inch plus OLED product with Apple Pencil support, well, then I'm starting to imagine that this is more of a tablet product, which also happens to be a phone. Hmm. 7 inches is, I mean, it's measured diagonally, that's iPad mini territory, mm -hmm. right? There's no phone near that scale I mean, there are some near that scale, but not quite there. So the rumor here comes from global technology research firm Omdia. And they say this product could launch as early as 2023. In analysis cited by investment research firm Equal Ocean, Omdia predicts that Apple will launch its long-rumored foldable phone, iPhone, in 2023. With a, with a display size 7.3 to 7.6 inches. Of course, it's got to have the OLED. And then the other piece is relating to the Apple Pencil. All the iPad products at this point support Apple Pencil. None of the phones do, right? So, interestingly, it could be a folding iPad first. Mm. I mean, we're just talking. I don't know. And certainly the iPad market is nowhere near the scale of the iPhone market. But it would be an interesting way for them to test the demand and to not necessarily bite into the phone product as much, mm -hmm. but to sell it as a secondary device. However, if it folds up, typically the appeal there is that, by the way, the iPad mini is a 7.9 inch display. This one could be as lar large as 7.6 inches. So I think Apple has always been very careful about cannibalizing its other product lines and not making the one device to try to rule them all. Mm -hmm. Whether we're talking about laptops that refuse to add a touch screen or flip and flap around in different ways, if we're talking about the separation between iOS and Mac OS that still exists, even in the presence of the M1 stuff, they've done a great job of making sure you have to purchase every item in the ecosystem, top to bottom, right. to be the true Apple fan. And so this... This puts them in an odd position having to develop this product. How do you make a product that you're going to recognize, you're going to realize a similar profit margin margin to having sold two products? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, that that's a big component in the complexity of launching such a thing. What is the right scale? What is the right form factor? And it's their first foldable. People will first want foldable. it. First foldable. But let me just ask you this. If, you're a, if you have to bet right now, 
unfoldable future for Apple, are they more likely to do the clamshell fold first or to do the landscape almost tablet scale fold first? Because hmm. both those rumors, you know, they could do both like Samsung has done. Yeah. Or they the could target time. one or the other. The tablet one looks to be more realistic for some reason. I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know why. Yeah. Because they have the pen support. Um, yeah. People it just want, seems more compelling. It's, yeah, it's like increasingly people want the powerhouse smartphone package. And we had some early evidence with the, with the mini model of the recent iPhone that maybe the demand wasn't all that much. Mm -hmm. So even if you go for the super sleek, pocketable, fashionable clamshell flip like that, you get curious about what the market is for it because of how much people are doing on their phones right now. Right. And, uh, and, and, and what they really want. So I agree with you. It's probably going to be this one first. 7.3 to 7.6 inches. you got to have OLED and uh, pencil support in there as well. Today's sponsor is DoorDash. You know about DoorDash. I know about DoorDash. Actually, it's funny you got the Cheesecake Factory over there. I was ordering the cheesecake the other day. Oh, yeah. I'm not even lying. I had the cheesecake, which had actually the real cake in there as well. So, like, regular fluffy cake, but also cheesecake. Any uh, flavor? Like a uh, blueberry or strawberry? No, no, no. It was more along the lines of, like, a... Like a like a fudge type flavoring, oh. like, like just doubling down on the chocolate aspect. Yeah. Okay. It was like a chocolate mousse, uh, cheesecake type of situation. Sounds he great. had the, uh, Lincoln had the uh, the peanut butter theme to it. You oh. can't eat that, Willie, do I apologize? With yeah. the, yes, yeah, so let's see, the, 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 he had Which the peanut, peanut butter type aspect. Something and, like this. And then Will went for no cheesecake at all, just a regular, just a regular cake, chocolate cake. Okay. But anyway, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's kind of boring. You're sitting at home these days. You say, what if we got some cheesecake right now? Yeah. Next thing you know, it's a party. Even though it's just your, your regular group, cheesecake can turn it around. Mm -hmm. That's the power of cheesecake. Anyway, today I got news for people. Never mind the cheesecake. We'll definitely get that as well. But DoorDash, it does more than just the food. What you can do now, Will... You can get snacks, drinks, and household essentials in 30 minutes. Look at I mean, that. 7-Eleven, CVS, all the variety stores, convenience stores. You don't know what you might need, Will, in a pinch. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the weather's not so nice, you want to step out there, and all of a sudden you got the things flying to your place via DoorDash. You know, you see 35 minutes. You see 39 minutes, whatever, which, whichever uh, one is closest or fastest for you, you pick up the convenience items. You might be about to sit down and watch a movie, Will, mm -hmm. and you don't have that snack. Yeah. And it's going to affect your enjoyment of that movie. Oh, definitely. By the way, what do you go for as the snack when it comes to the movies? Uh, I like ice cream. Oh, wow. Yeah. Go for an ice uh, cream. Ben and Jerry's. Charlie, oh. Cherry Garcia. No problem there. It's very good. No problem there. Yeah. You don't have to convince me. Yeah. Anyway, so DoorDash, I mean, you jump on there nowadays and it's everything is on there. It's 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. And you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Popeye's, Chipotle, Cheesecake Factory, uh, 7-Eleven, obviously, as I mentioned previously, for, uh, for all your snacks and such. And the best part of this, since they're sponsoring the show here, is you can catch a deal yourself for checking out DoorDash for a limited time. You can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on your first order of $15 or more. All you have to do is download the DoorDash app and enter the code LOULATER2021. It's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code LOULATER2021. Do not forget the code. I'll have it in the description. LOULATER2021, 25 percent off download the doordash app in the app store or on android do it do it now apple has won has won a little dispute a little victory over there in north dakota hmm. and north dakota became the unlikely battleground or initial battle between uh well at, at least at least 
a, a, a sort of portion of it having implications here on the pre-existing feud between Epic and Apple. Hmm. You remember they didn't they, they got their they got their differences. Epic and Apple. So this is their battleground. It's weird that it ended up in North Dakota because you're sitting there saying, what does North Dakota have to do with this? Mm. And I'm still trying to figure that. No, I'm just. <laughs> uh, it just so happens to be to, to be the, the to be the place, the initial place for a case like this to actually play out. Huh. But it has implications everywhere else because it is a Senate, and this same type of conversation around whether or not the government should get involved in policing how Apple and Google run their app stores, hmm. whether or not it should be some kind of more open situation where you get to install whatever you want on your hardware from whichever store you want, or if these companies should be capable of maintaining the level of control that they currently have, you know, the, the epic story, essentially. The North Dakota State Senate voted 36 to 11 on Tuesday not to pass a bill that would have required app stores to enable software developers to use their own payment processing software and avoid fees charged by Apple and Google. This vote is a victory for Apple. Apple opposes the bill, and last week Apple official, uh, an Apple official testified that the bill threatens to destroy the iPhone as you know it. And so Epic is in there saying, look, Epic and others for the record, they're saying, look, we feel like this is, uh, they got too much control. Uh, we want the opportunity here to kind of control a little bit more of the experience for our customers and if you remember the original Fortnite stuff the the situation there was to try to pass savings on to the customers mm -hmm. that apple because apple takes a chunk man it's you know 30 points yep and so they've been pushing and it's it's been a it's been an ongoing battle but this is bad news for them because the vote comes through and they say look apple's doing more than just collecting your funds here they're maintaining an app store that they consider to be safe and the officials from apple say hey if we this is our hardware and if we're not in control of what exists on the store shelves mm -hmm. then something that would be like this is the analogy they use here it would be like if you had a store a grocery store and you had no control over what they, people were putting on your shelves mm. that's the analogy they use which works well in a courtroom or at a hearing, yeah. because you can you can uh, imagine it. You yeah. can it adds texture to it. So mm -hmm. you can imagine you're the shop owner. You say, yeah, you can't put that nasty stuff on my shelf. That yeah. might be unsafe. The whole aisle of cigarettes. I don't want that. Yeah, yeah, it might be something like that. So anyway, they're not done yet. This is just North Dakota, and many people in the Senate there in North Dakota were like, don't have your battles over here. They were like, we don't even have. We don't have enough hangar space for all your private jets to come into North Dakota and have your beef over here. Huh. Go back, go do it in California or somewhere else. Huh. Uh, not everybody even wanted to be. Uh, is that what they said? <laughs> no, they didn't say these things. But you know what I'm. It's 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 like this is just one node, and it's not necessarily representative of the whole thing. But it is a it was a weird battleground. Epic hoped to win it. It looks like Apple has won this round. Hmm. R remains to be seen what's going to happen on a national level or once the as their uh, disagreement progresses. But anyway, another person who ha has some tension with Apple right now is, is uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. He had, I guess, an email was flo floating around, which it was an internal email. We need to inflict pain. <laughs> Dark. <laughs> and it's one of those things where if you're writing an email internally, I mean, you know as you click send to thousands of people, it's going to come out, right? Whatever you say. So it feels strategic to me. Like it's obviously not a misstep, but he mm. knew it was going to get out. The question is to why that language specifically was used. Obviously, it's not meant in a literal sense, but it must be meant to motivate the troops a little bit to say... This is war. Well, this is just a bigger... This is a bigger threat to what we're doing yeah. than you may think at the moment. They've had their differences for sure around the privacy stuff. And then I think maybe things escalated when Tim went on YouTube or where, where did he go? I don't even know where he went. 
Tim put out a video and he's basically sitting there saying Apple is the only company that cares about you and everyone else sucks. And yep. and Facebook sucks and everyone wants your data and Apple's the only one who cares about privacy. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, mm -hmm. but he just spoke about Apple's attributes and, and focus and how they're not... I mean, Apple's not in the same business as Facebook or Google. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. They're trying to sell you the hardware and the software, but they're not really... Since they're not advertising to you for the most part, unless they want you to buy that hardware. Uh -huh. But once you have the device, they're not doing it. So they don't, they just have different business models. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Zuckerberg came out and apparently he described that uh, those comments by Tim Cook as extremely glib. Of course, he thinks this is an attack, a direct attack on Facebook and Facebook's business model and believes that it is some serious threat to them doing what they need to do. And so the tensions are there. Apparently the last time these two met was in 2017. They were trying to smooth out a souring relationship, but that meeting resulted in a tense standoff. And since then, the relationship has continued to oh. sour. So. Their, their Facebook is facing off. Yeah. It's a face-off. They and should have a boxing match. To me, it seems like Apple has the leverage here. However, it hasn't stopped Facebook from doing things like we spoke about, taking a full-page ad in the New York Times, mm -hmm. and also apparently considering legal, as, legal actions, uh, alleging that it might, this might be anti-competitive behavior. So I think we're just at the early stages here. But you got to, I mean, definitely Facebook and Epic are kind of on the same page. You have to assume Facebook was probably rooting for Epic in that North Dakota situation. Mm. In fact, uh, this article suggests, Wall Street Journal suggests, that Facebook has directly aided Epic Games in their battle against oh. Apple. So the tech giants, you the know, allies. you know, squaring off. Yeah. <laughs> How about this one? You sent it over my way. Handwritten job application by Steve Jobs. A job application, Steve Jobs' job application. Hmm. And they don't, I don't know if they know where it, it, he was applying to. It seems to indicate that it's a little bit vague here. The date is somewhere around the time that Steve Jobs had dropped out of Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Uh, a year later, he joined Atari as a technician where he worked with Steve Wozniak before Apple became a thing in 1976. It's weird. What is that date? What does that date say there? Up 93? Top? It must be 73. 73, yeah. Yeah, it must be Sorry. 73 because 76, he goes to Atari. It's crazy to think. You had, no, you had nothing going, I mean, not nothing, but you had Atari going on. Mm -hmm. And then this chance meeting, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, double Steve. And next thing you know, Tom Paul, Tim Cook, and Zuckerberg having their beef. <laughs> it's crazy how things happen. But anyway, this is a collector's item. And the last time it was up for auction, it fetched $175,000. In the questionnaire, Steve Jobs highlights his experience with computers and calculators. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Remember those calculators when you were in high school? What were they called? Like Texas Instruments, yep. something or other. And everybody had to have this one. Once you got to a certain age or grade, it would be like, no, no, no. You had to have this one um, because things got serious. <laughs> yeah, I remember this one. Is that the, the one? The TI something similar. That's a hundred bucks, man. That's the, no joke. Yeah, trying to look at parabolas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the uh, curves. I mean, I guess they worked yeah. out, but like in retrospect, those things seem kind of. Uh, well, anyway, they were heavy duty, man. Yeah, they 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 look so antiquated by today's standards, but I I, I presume like look at that that thing is sixteen one thousand six hundred fifty dollars. So did yeah. everyone get one in your class? Like to to just borrow and I think use? everybody got one, man. Yeah, they're oh. Does they that seem expensive. crazy at the price? We they, the ones we had were probably a hundred bucks would be my right. guess. But still, it is kind of wild that every kid purchased one. But anyway. He was an expert in that, and a special, he had special abilities in electronic tech or design engineer digital. So these were some of the things outlined on this particular handwritten uh, job application. Anyway, it's coming back up for auction. Presumably, this individual wants more than the $175,000 that was paid for it in 2018. You know, collector's items 
and collectibles, it's booming right now, Will. Yes. Like everything else with the Bitcoin and the stocks and all this stuff. People are looking to make a buck. So it's probably, maybe it's a good time. The auction is online. It runs for four hours on February 24th. So you may want to check that out. You can sign up to bid right now if this is the thing you need to add to your collection. Good luck. Uh, the sliding interior of Hyundai's new Ionic 5. Man. Hyundai. Let there, me tell you. Yeah. Think, man, formidable. They're looking pretty, pretty neat. It's somehow, I don't know what, how or... I, Maybe you just run a, a company. something. I don't know what happened. Did they hire somebody or what is a BTS response? What's going on? Look at that. Because I'm following the news here and I'm thinking to myself, okay, pe pe people talk about Tesla. I've been talking about Porsche because of the Taycan. You know, people people talking about GM's going to try to go all electric. They had to Hummer at the... And we got all these truck companies coming out. But then I'm reading more about what Hyundai's up to. And I'm like, oh, damn, they're a threat. Uh -huh. They're a legit threat because they're talking about things that are just uh, very compelling features. And they have BTS. And they got BTS. You know? So they showed off this little teaser of their sliding interior. And there's a GIF of it on the Verge article here. To make it possible for you to get out of your car as the driver in either direction so if you can if you're in a tight parking space you can get out the passenger side easily mm. you see the gif look the whole thing the slides way back so you could just travel across the front of your car to the passenger door but also this is this is giving more leg room yeah and a foot rest and just tremendous cabin flexibility here now it's just a teaser Chill out. You're all uh, you're high strung here. Well, <laughs> just a teaser, this but is exciting. It's a cool, cool. I, I like this kind of stuff. They're calling it the Universal Island. It moves out of the way so the driver or passengers can easily enter and exit either side of the car when parked in a narrow spot. And like a footrest, you only see well, where were you seeing a footrest in a top tier S class mm. Maybach? That's where you get a footrest. Or you get it in your Ionic electric. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Now, some other stuff that stands out to me, they say the interior over here is going to be eco-conscious on the materials, which this type of clientele, they don't mind that stuff. Also, it's going to have a feature that turns the car into a rolling gener generator with 3.5 kilowatts of vehicle-to-load V2L power. You know I know kilowatts. I don't mind... A couple kilowatts. This is a rolling generator. In fact, to do something similar on your Tesla, you had to fit it with uh, an inverter of sorts, which oh. may void the warranty. But out the gate, this thing is a generator. Huh. So you can, you're doing your camping, you're powering your other devices. They say this thing is enough juice to power a full-sized oven, a treadmill, or five giant speakers. Wow. That's a party, Will. Mm -hmm. Oh! And the best part, which I talked about previously, but is the killer feature. Five minutes of charge, 100 kilometers of travel. Mm. Five minutes of charge. This the one get Willie Do going over here. Look at him. Yeah. He started cracking his knuckles. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Five minute charge, 100 KMs, and over 500 kilometers on a single charge total. World premiere February 22nd at 11 p.m. California time. Exciting. We will be watching. Mm -hmm. We'll be watching. All right. Now, Tesla's, Tesla's got to do something. You know, they had uh, promised an even cheaper vehicle than the Model 3. And we talked somewhat recently about Tesla exploring the idea of having a local designer in China create a car for that market at a different price point and for, for, for that particular clientele, which could then make its way to the rest of the world. Hmm. Here we have an artist's rendering of what could be the Tesla Model 2. And, of course, this would be the cheapest model. They're suggesting $25,000, looking like a little hatchback. Keep in mind, this is just an artist's rendering. Hmm. It, could, it doesn't necessarily have to look this aggressive. 
But my question for you, Willie Do, is the same one that Electrek posed to me when I read this this morning, which is dope or nope? I think it's dope. Hey, man. I think it looks really mean. Yes. And aggressive. I agree. Which is, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, the name, though. Uh, Model 2. It doesn't fit the whole, you know, sexy. You know what I mean? Oh, um, you don't think they, they can keep that like going, though. The Cybertruck like, already broke that. Yeah. Well, Cybertruck was kind of like a... I don't know. What about Roadster? When different. they eventually do that, that's not going to do it either. Yeah. I think they got to give that the, that meme up. I mean, maybe not. I know I know Elon is the meme lord, but... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You don't I'm like Model 2. I, I don't know yet. Okay. But All what right. do you think? Well, about the name, I was talking more just strictly the design the design which i also think this concept is, cool. is pretty good looking yeah, yeah, yeah. for a hatchback and uh now there some of the comments down here are suggesting that it couldn't look this mean because the aerodynamics and such mm. it probably couldn't have quite the sharpness to it so it could be like a toned down version particularly if it's not the performance model but you can see the similarity with the wheels to the model 3 and the black trim components and What's interesting here was something that might look good on other Teslas, the black line on the, on the, on oh, the yeah. going into the roof there uh, above the sort of window frame. It's like two-tone. Top edge. Yeah, two-tone two look to it is kind of cool. So anyway, the speculation is we can see something like this uh, possibly for China first and then maybe elsewhere after or everywhere at the same time. But I know a lot of people who'd be interested in a $25,000 Tesla. I'll tell you that right now. Mm-hmm. I got this video, number 16 on trending, actually. Interesting. I didn't even know that. Xbox just launched their new wireless headset. I don't know if you caught this video, but uh, obviously Sony, they have their first-party headset for the PlayStation 5. And why should Microsoft be left out? So they put this together, and I actually quite like the design, to be honest with you. It's, you know, we got the rounded thing going on here. kind of looks like a high-end pair of headphones. Yep. The uh, there's there's a couple cool features here being native to the system. There's an auto mute feature, a voice isolation feature for crystal clear chat, and of course direct pairing to your console up to 15 hours of battery life. Game loud and clear with the all new Xbox wireless headset. There is something to be said about the first party product for something like this, mm. where it just integrates very well with all the features. Uh, you can also take Bluetooth on there for calls. So you can have it paired up to your phone oh, nice. as well if there's an interruption or something. Of course, you can also bend the microphone out of the way, which is a common feature on headsets. So they thought about a few different things here. I'm curious about the build quality considering the price. It's not an expensive headset. I think it's going to be 99 bucks, which I guess, I, I don't know, is that... It's to compete with with Sony's product, yeah. obviously. Yeah, ninety nine ninety nine is the MSRP. You can see the uh, giant wheel on the side there. Is it a wheel? Yeah, it looks like it. Spinning around in the thing and a green light going around there too. Very is that Xboxy. A light? Is that a tattoo on the wrist, by the way? Yeah, like waves. Huh. Symbolic. Interesting. Do you think that that was considered? Yes. Wow! The way that it's the sleeve is very, you know... Couple of waves. Revealing. Very interesting. Yeah. Immerse yourself in the game. I like the simplicity of the product. Sometimes you'll see the microphone component will kind of look a little not very elegant. Mm -hmm. This microphone component, I don't know how well it's going to operate, but it has a really simplified look to it. Just a little capsule. Yeah. No, no foam. No foam. And some of them have the foam and then a bendable boom, which is like this little wire, yeah. which ends up looking, I don't know, kind of... Like, what are we doing here? Kind of so ugly. So it does spin. It the, does uh, spin, right? Yeah. This part. Rotate 360. Yeah, look, I mean, that's cool as well. So anyway, I'm excited. I think it's kind of, you know... Yeah. It's a clean look to it, as they say. And the question will be around performance, but you got the Dolby stuff in there. And... Keep in mind, I actually liked Microsoft's product they put out with the Surface headphones. So if they're pulling anything from the, what they learned over there into this here at a cheaper price point, okay then. And it will probably integrate with Windows as well. I, w I mean, that's Microsoft. Yeah. They have, there are a couple advantages there to being Microsoft. 
Bitcoin jumped over 50 G's. And I guess it wasn't there for very long, but people celebrated nonetheless. It's a big number, Will, 50 G's. Symbolic. Mm -hmm. People say we go over 50, it means we got 100. Yeah. Like 100 is next. It's the next milestone there. Yeah. Uh, maybe you get people at 75, the way we work as far as milestones. Mm -hmm. But $50,000 USD was significant for a number of people. You had people tweeting. You had people talking. The usual suspects. And a lot of this is on the back of the fact that, you know, stuff we've been talking about, Tesla, MasterCard, BNY Mellon, these are the large companies who have recently shown their support for Bitcoin. PayPal is supposed to be around the corner embracing the thing. Obviously, Jack Dorsey's companies are super into it. They purchased a bunch of Bitcoin themselves. Yep. Or they talked about it. No, they did. And... So the question is, how, how far can the thing go? How high can the thing go? Everyone is super curious about it. But the other, on the flip side of the equation, there's some that wonder if it's going to be like 2017, where we hit some new record and then things fall down again. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people don't think that's going to be the case. They think this time it's different. And the reason for the suggestion that it's different is because of these institutions, because of the types of investment into Bitcoin that's happening now that wasn't quite the same back in 2017 but it's certainly looking like a steep climb over there when you when you pull it out to all my god will you do that's a freaky cliff i mean it's not a cliff yet but it's just such a spike to it mm -hmm. that i understand some people's apprehensions but this might be it who knows Fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. uh one of the other companies mentioned in this article uber they had also discussed the idea of buying Bitcoin, but are also now considering accepting it, which is actually big. You know, Uber's a big fleet. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the cars, if you're talking about the food, if you're talking about whatever, uh, if overnight they're accepting the, the crypto, then that puts a lot more online over there as well. So anyway, 50,000 bucks. What do you say, Will? It's going to 100, going to zero. What's it going to do? Uh... I think it's going to rise. Okay, you got the rocket ship on it. Willie do got the, the rocket moon. ship. You know who doesn't have the rocket ship is Bill Gates. He says he's not a Mars person. <laughs> no, he's not the type. <laughs> what a thing to say, I'm not a Mars person. He's like, I, I'm a Earth guy. <laughs> I'm more into Earth. It's like, how can, you, how can you not be curious at least? We're all on some level Mars people because as humans, we're curious. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I guess to what extent? Well, he does clarify. He says, look, we got too many problems over here to be right. goofing with the Mars stuff. That's his take. Makes he's, sense. All, he's all about the, the vaccines. And he says there's all kinds of hard stuff like steel, cement and meat, which he would like to tackle first prior to thinking about Mars. He says, sadly, people only think about electricity, passenger cars, but they're only a third of the problem. He's really concerned about climate change. Just put out a book about it. He does have a quote here saying something nice about Elon. I don't know if they're pals or what they are, but I, I actually don't think they are. Okay. But anyway, I'm just speculating. I feel like there's evidence of such. But anyway, he says, well, it's important to say that what Elon did with Tesla is one of the greatest contributions to climate change anyone's ever made. And, you know, underestimating Elon is not a good idea. But he added he's not a Mars person and he doesn't think rockets are the solution. Well, obviously, he's promoting a book on climate change. So he's mm -hmm. going to be a lot more zeroed in on the climate of this planet mm -hmm. as opposed to another one. Uh, he says, we're basically not doing enough on the hard stuff, steel, cement, and meat. And sadly, the things people think about, electricity, passenger cars, are only a third of the problem. So we have to work on the two-thirds. And if all, if all you pay attention to is those short-term metrics, not the green premiums across the board, then you miss out on what is the longest lead time, which is the hard stuff. In other words, tackling the things he's interested in tackling in take the longest and therefore the longer you wait to get started on them the tougher those problems become mm -hmm. he also said he would rather spend his money on measles vaccines as opposed to traveling in a space rocket right he says i'm not going to pay a lot of money because my foundation can buy measles vaccines and save a life for 1000 so anything i do i always think okay 
I could spend that 1000 buying measles vaccines. It's a valid point. Yeah, I, I mean, but he, he also takes heat for just being too, too much in that direction. Uh-huh. Right? He, uh, there's just like anything in life. There's people who have their positions and have their uh, agendas and motivations and all the rest of it. I'm sure that Elon would have some rebuttal saying, okay, what good is a measles vaccine when AI destroys every, you know, like, or what good is a measles vaccine when, I don't know whatever problem is supposed to occur in Elon's head, but he's saying by becoming interplanetary, it's even bigger than that. Yeah. They should have a fireside chat. Yeah. Just hash it out. I just feel like actually, I I don't know. I could be wrong, but I don't. I, it might be like mixing oil and water. I'm not sure it would be a vibe between the two. Mm. And I hate to use the word vibe, but I don't know what other way to put it. Rapport or uh, I'm not sure that they're interfacing. Yeah. All that. I understand. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm maybe they've talked publicly somewhere. But you've seen chats like this. Like remember? Uh, maybe Rogan can be the oh, mediator. Oh, oh, Rogan's in the middle. Yeah. And then the both of them. Okay, I like this. Yeah. I, I would sign up to listen to that. Uh-huh. Because uh-huh. there's been times where I've seen Elon with the wrong person. And I'm like, oh, this is painful. Uh-huh, yeah. So. They th- need a mediator. There's that as well. Adidas plans to sell Reebok. This has been a thing that some have speculated on for a while. Reebok's been having a difficult time. Meanwhile, Adidas, on the other hand, they've been having a great time. They've been blowing up in uh, uh, well a variety of markets and they're starting to say hey look we think reebok would be better on its own mm. we feel like maybe we're the ones holding it back uh they bought it 15 years ago and paid 3.8 billion dollars that was in 2006 sluggish performance has led to repeated calls from investors to dispose of the brand they're looking for around 1.2 billion what do you think will you want to turn around reebok or what I thought yeah. with the UFC deal, they did. Uh, they were doing okay. Yeah, but apparently not. Apparently not. They uh, they've they've shrunk a number of times here. Let's see what it says. Reebok's net sales fell seven percent in the third quarter, twenty twenty, to four hundred and eighty eight million year, uh, dollars, which is not nothing. Like there's a company there for sure. Mm-hmm. You make a half half a billion dollars in sales. The problem is it fell as much as forty. 40- four percent the preceding quarter so the numbers don't look good for the future on it now what happened with nike and adidas that keeps them near the top they keep cutting the deals with the right names Mm -hmm. i mean who who does adidas have they have pharrell they have kanye i believe they got beyonce and nike we don't even need to talk about nike got everybody Mm -hmm. so if 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 Reebok, if I'm buying Reebok right now, oh, they got Messi. These are mostly soccer players over here, but I'm t- I apologize, football players. Sheesh, get it together, Lou. Get it together. Yeah. Oh, they, they see. As far as basketball is concerned, it's not down to 14, 15, and then the NFL comes in after that. Either way. It's been tough for Reebok. Mm -hmm. They got to cut these deals. And they started to cut some of these deals. They did a Cardi B deal. Oh. I don't know if you saw this. A Reebok Cardi B. I don't know actually what they put together, but they're trying to put a focus on women's apparel. You know people like the nostalgia and stuff like this? Play up on a kind of classic looks. Like that's a classic Reebok look. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make it loud. So... Maybe things can turn around, but either way, it looks like Adidas doesn't want to be the one to do it. They're saying, somebody please take this off our hands, and you go do the thing you got to do with it. Hmm. Because we're too busy over here. We got a booming business, and uh, we feel like more can be done with the brand. So we'll have to wait and see. But I have positive memories with the brand, you know? Yeah. I remember the pump stuff was the coolest thing when you were a kid. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, I got a weird one for you, Will. Apparently, Chinese couples are rushing to file for divorce because there's a new law that's going to require a 30-day cooling off period, which is about to kick in. And what this is, the way, <laughs> the way this works is you go down and you say, I'm done. We're done. It's okay. over. And then they say to you, 
okay. We noted, noted that you're done. Go back home for 30 days. Oh, kind of like think about what you did. Go back home for 30 days. Then you come back to me. You still want to do it 30 days. Both of you. Then you get the divorce. Mm. Okay. So this is about to go into effect. And people are are trying to get their divorces in before it goes into effect. Yeah. <laughs> Because they feel it's going to be a lot more complex. So much they so. they think that they're rushing it. Lawyers are charging a premium right now. The lawyers, they can't get divorced fast enough because they're yeah. worried about this cooling off period and the stipulations around it. Yeah. See, <laughs> if one party, here's an example, okay? 30-day cooling off period, one party says, you know what? I don't still want to do it. Huh. Then it can't be done. And then you got to sue the person in order to divorce them or prove, obviously, if there's some reason, if it's some kind of violence or something, it's different. Mm -hmm. It would be considered different. But it's a lot of pro like it, I didn't realize how big of a story this was. I'm sitting here reading this article and I find out it's like that's one of the top trending things on Chinese social media. More than 600 million comments were posted using the hashtag oppose divorce cooling off period. People are saying, let us do whatever we want to do. Mm -hmm. Don't be telling me about my cooling off period. Other commenters say, oh, maybe it should be cooling off on the initial point with the marriage. Maybe there should be a 30-day 30, mm. 30 wait. Before way. that. Yeah, yeah you go in and say, well, we think we want to uh, get married. And you say, no, no, come back in 30 days. <laughs> you still want to do it. I would think there would be more unrest. Yeah, uh, no, that doesn't that sound, point, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound very romantic. But yeah. here's the thing, Well, uh, divorce rate, huge in China, blowing up right now. In 2019, they have 4.7 million, which was up from 1.3 million in 2003. Mm. Like a huge increase. And COVID, you know, COVID didn't help. Yeah. People were bouncing. Yeah. And so they were trying to, uh, I presume there's belief that there, that through uh, some stability there, that there might be some economic in, uh, incentive. Mm to keep these couples to I don't know what the involvement is from the government side why they want to do it but people are opposing the idea at least 600 million put the comments maybe some of the comments were not opposing it but uh, very uh, strange uh, development over here yeah I don't know which other way to put it but mm -hmm. it's see imagine you read the law and then you're like damn I better get this divorce done with yeah, let's Isn't get that this so, over with. Let's hurry up. It's so weird, right? Yeah, it's weird that they have to enforce this. Like, why? You know? Trying to figure out the incentive for it? Yeah. I mean, could it be just a traditional values thing and that's it? Maybe. But part of me thinks there might be some economic component. I don't know what. Hmm. Like, are, is there some sort of... Because, for example, they had the one-child policy and then, and then they got rid of it. But then yeah. they couldn't necessarily encourage... The growth, and we've talked on this particular show many times about the upside down triangle, this the demographics in China rapidly changing and mm -hmm. aging. And so maybe there's a feeling that if there's a lot of divorce or separation, that there could be fewer, uh, less growth right. in the population, which could result in less growth economically. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, we're sitting here. Uh -huh. We're sitting here. Yeah. Just it's a back and forth with the thought process. Yeah, I don't know this be to be fact. I'm just curious. Traditions thing could be a lineage thing, population thing. It's a lot yeah. to it, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty. I mean, you can imagine something like that here or in the U.S. It would be big. It would also be big news. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right, this is the last one for me. You sent it to me. Very interesting. How about see-through wood? Apparently, scientists are working on a substitute for glass, in which the wood itself could be your window. It turns out that uh, previously this just wasn't feasible from a cost perspective or a uh, resource perspective to try to make this stuff. You can do it. It's quite interesting the what gives wood pigment and makes it opaque. Uh, anyway, they discovered that there might be an easier way than some of the former techniques involving uh, a simple, simple chemical, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, which people, some people use to, for hair dye to bleach the hair, uh -huh. that it can have a similar effect on wood, and it's actually used in paper to make paper white. It doesn't necessarily make it transparent, but it's part of the step towards it. 
Uh, I think what happens is afterwards, uh, the chemical modifies the chromophores, changing their structure so they no longer act to absorb light and color the wood. It can be brushed onto wood and then activated using light to get to the white material. Mm. All right. And uh, the other reason paper is white is because pores or holes in its structure scatter light, just like the hollow cellulose fibers in wood. Filling those fibers with resin reduces the scattering, allowing the light to pass through the wood and making it transparent. Okay, Whoa. this is above the pay grade, obviously. Yeah. But it's interesting nonetheless because obviously there's the planet has some wood. Glass is hard. See through wood. Imagine the possibilities. Yeah, can you imagine like wood blending into like a transparent kind of uh Whoa. wall? Whoa. That would be really cool. Yeah, cuz pre previously that's the other part. Previously the other techniques would actually kind of screw up the uh, structure, mm. the strength of the of the wood. Apparently this maintains the integrity. So you could have a see-through log cabin. Whoa. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know if you could do that or not, but <laughs> it's cool yeah, anyway. I wish, I wish this article had some pictures. But, yeah, it would be uh, cool to see. Yeah, I agree with you. It would be cool to see. Actually, maybe if we click on the original article over here, maybe there are some pictures. Down at the bottom, there's a, an original article. But no, they're not showing off their... They're not showing off their findings yet. Anyway, we'll move on to the last story of the day because this is Willie Do's moment. This uh, segment of the show, it's a thing that we haven't done enough of. We somehow got away from it. It's its a section of the, of the show which is called Willie Do's wild card round. And he takes this part of the show, this segment, very seriously. He wants to bring you the best. And... Uh, for whatever reason, I forgot to include it in the previous episodes. It's my fault. I fully apologize. But today, he reminded me of the segment. He said today's the day to revive it, especially based on the caliber of the story that he's bringing to the table today and his level of expertise in this particular category. In which case, I said, you know what, Will? Uh, we got to bring it back, and I can't wait to see what you have to offer. And I would love for you to close the show today. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the segment, Willie Do's Wild Card Round, the finale for today's show. Uh, um, well, you and I always like McDonald's, you know, and uh, I just found this cool article um, McDonald's is selling chicken hoodies for five dollars, and I think it's coming out in a couple days, along with their chicken sandwich, their new chicken sandwich, the battle battle it out with, uh, I guess Popeyes. Um, so yeah, it's five dollars. You can check it out. You know, um, yeah, there it is. 